Well, hello, this is Jeff Gadiosi, and you're on MisplacedStraws.com, where music comes to life. And my guest today is the founding member of the legendary band Foreigner. And I am so very happy to say he is also a member of the 2024 class of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The band will finally receive this honor, this long overdue honor, in Cleveland on October 19th. Please welcome Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Al Greenwood. Welcome, hey, Al. Hey, how are you, Jeff? Doing great. And, you know, let's start with the hall. I mean, other oh. than it's about time, which is what all of us felt. Yes. When you heard the announcement, what were the feelings and emotions going through your head? Well, obviously, we waited a long time for this. It's been 20 years overdue. Um, and we i just about given up any hope of getting in. So to hear it uh, be announced that we were uh, nominated was just a joy. I mean, you know, a lifetime achievement to be able to be one of the people that are my idols, you know, that's just such a, a humbling experience. So then to get all the fans voting and that, that felt so great having everybody voting and, and trying to get us in there. It was just a wonderful thing. Um, our fans are just some of the best out there. So it was remarkable. And then uh, we get the induction, uh, you know, notification that we're in. Um, and it, it was just a joyous experience. I mean, I popped a bottle of champagne. I said, you know, here we go. Nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, to be in a group of incredible artists, it is so humbling to be part of that group and finally be in there. Um, you know, year after year, we'd wait for the nominations to be announced and we'd never, <laughs> never be part of it. Um, we thought we, we had, you know, what it took to get in there. I mean, we've sold over 80 million, you know, I mean, the, what we've accomplished is just incredible. But uh, to not even be recognized was, was uh, a bit disappointing over the years. But we're finally in. And that's great. I, I feel so good. It's such a relief. It, it, it's funny because I think you're in in a really good class of other oh, yeah. acts that are sort of in that same boat you were with Peter Frampton and yeah. Ozzy finally getting their due as well. Exactly. I, yeah. I feel the same way. I, I think this class, I think we've all been waiting in this yeah. class. And there's such talented people. I'm so honored to be a part of, you know, this class going in because they're all great artists. And mm -hmm. wow, I mean, Cher, Jesus, <laughs> Yeah. Peter Frampton and Ozzy. I mean, just all of them is just incredible. And now kind of looking back through the band's history that got us to this point, um, back in the beginning, you know, New York, 1976, you and Mick Jones put a band together. That first lineup doesn't quite gel, but then the pieces come together for the what would end up being the original lineup of Foreigner. How did you and Mick first meet and then bring in the rest of the guys? Well, uh, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll make it as, as uh, concise as I can. Um, uh, at the end of 1975, uh, I was in another band with a few members of a English prog band called Flash, sure. uh, Con Carter and Mike Huff. And that band broke up and I, got my own band together. And uh, this was early 76, I'd say early February of 1976. I get a phone call and it's from uh, Mick Jones. And he says, I'm putting a project together and I got your name from a mutual friend. Would you be interested? And I said, well, actually I have my own band right now. You know, uh, you're welcome to come down and go to our rehearsal and check it out. You know, it was all the songs that I had been writing. So uh, that night he came down with Bud Prager, who would be our manager eventually. Um, and they listened to the band, didn't say very much, <laughs> got up and left. But the next day I got another phone call and he said, I really liked what you were doing. Um, would you be interested? And I said, uh, okay, I, I think you're, you're a little ahead of what I've got. So <laughs> I think I'm going to take that shot. So um, our first rehearsal, we, uh, it was in Bud Prager's office. He had a, an office at 1790 Broadway in Manhattan. 
And in the middle of his office was like a storage area with file cabinets and things like that. So uh, we moved aside the, all the file cabinets. Uh, the drummer then was Stan Williams. So he set up his drums. The bass player was Jay Davis. He set up his bass rig. Of course, Mick Jones on guitar. He had it set up his stuff and I brought up my keyboards and we started jamming. Uh, this was the very beginning. So the first day of, mm. of anything. Yeah. And after about two weeks of jamming, I go home and I'm saying to myself, I don't know about this. You know, <laughs> there's, there's no songs. It, it, we're just having, I mean, it's a great time. I love, you know, playing, but I don't think it's going anywhere. So I'm about to go in that next day and uh, tell Mick, you know, I think I'm going to just mm -hmm. go back with my band. So I go in and uh, Mick comes in and he says, I've got this song and he starts playing feels like the first time mm -hmm. on guitar. And I go, Holy crap. This is, yeah, this is it. It. <laughs> we got something here. So, um, thank goodness he started playing that because I would have not have been in it. I would have said, you know, I'm, I'm out of here, but, uh, uh, that started the whole thing rolling. Mm -hmm. Uh, we started working on feels like the first time two weeks later, Ian McDonald walks in mm. and I was a huge King Crimson fan. Yeah. I mean, uh, McDonald and Charles King Crimson, I followed his career and here he walks into our rehearsal. I was like, wow. Um, so we started working on like three or four songs, putting them together. But Prager says, let's go into the studio. Let's make a tape of these songs. We go into the hit factory. Uh, we don't have a singer. We go into the hit factory, we make a tape of four songs, what's called a demo tape. And for auditions, we'd have uh, singers come in one by one into the studio with a mic in the studio and sing on top of Feels Like the First Time. And after about 40 or 50 singers, <laughs> we were going nowhere again. It was like, wow, what's going on here? So then Mick says, you know, I remember this group um, that we played with, they're called Black Sheep, and they had a really good singer. I thought he was really good. So he went home that night and he took out uh, the album. I think Lou had given him the record when they did the show and he played it and he said, yeah, I, I think this guy's got something. So uh, he calls up uh, Lou in Rochester. And he says, you know, I'm putting same thing he said to me, I'm putting a band together. Would you be interested in being a singer? And he says, you know, I just, my band just broke up. He was in Black Sheep and, and um, they just lost their record deal. And he was like, really, not really into getting back into another band that quick. So Mick says, you know, we'll fly you down, you know, audition, uh, whatever it takes, we'd like you to come down here. And he says, well, let me think about it. So a couple of days later, Mick calls him back and he, uh, Lou says, okay, I'll come down. So he comes down, comes into the studio, just like everybody else, goes behind the microphone, feels like the first time, lyrics are there. And within about the first two lines of the song, we said, this is our guy. I mean, he just blew us away. It was just a perfect match. And uh, he put his vocal on the four tracks that we had and uh, Bud Prager, started shopping it, you know, bringing it to various labels to see if we could get any interest. And they all turned us down. Everybody hmm. got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so at this point, we still had Stan Williams on drums and Jay Davis on bass guitar. And uh, they said, look, this doesn't look like we're going to get anywhere. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to have to leave. So they both left the band. So we don't, the band is basically non-functioning. We didn't have a record deal. We didn't have, you know, all the players. And Bud Prager turns around and says, you know what? I think you guys, perfect fit would be for Atlantic Records to pick you guys up. So I'm going to bring the tape up there personally again and have them listen to it again. So he goes up to Atlantic and he goes into the A&R department office, which is uh, artists and repertoire. They're the ones that listen to the tapes. And uh, he starts playing it again. He says, you know, we already passed on this and stuff like that. 
So he's playing the tape again, and in walks John Kalagner. I'm, I'm not sure exactly of all, all the events that take place. You'd have to talk to John mm -hmm. about this. But what I understood to what happened is that John list, heard the tape and he said, who is this? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the other a and person said, it's a band called Trigger. We were called Trigger at the time. And he says, and he says well, we passed on these guys. He says, I, I think they're really good. Mm -hmm. So John Kalodner takes the tape up to the president of Atlantic Records, who was Jerry Greenberg at the time. And he goes, Jerry, you got to sign these guys. I think they're really good. I think this is going to happen. He says, no, we've already passed on this band. He says, no, no. You... <laughs> so he insisted. And we, we got the record deal. So which was another dilemma. Of course, now we have a record deal, but we don't have a full band because two mm -hmm. of the guys left. So again, we start auditioning for a drummer and a bass player. And uh, we found Dennis Elliott mm -hmm. as a drummer and Ed Gagliardi as our bass player. And about two weeks after we got them, I mean, we went into rehearsal to go over the songs that we we're gonna do. And we went right into the recording studio. And this was uh, the end of 1976, uh, probably around October, I would say, September, October of 76. Um, recording the first album, and uh, the record came out in March of 77, and the rest is history. I mean, the thing just skyrocketed. It yeah, just... Well, that's why, I mean, it was such a short time between formation and a hit record, touring, headlining. Did the speed at which that moved so you guys have all been veterans of the scene at that point, but did the speed of all of that just take you completely by surprise? Um, at the time, it felt like everything was going in slow motion. <laughs> no, <because laughs> there were a lot of disappointments along the way. So, uh, you know, the the band could have broken up a few times, you know, during that, that, that whole, it was a year and a month, mm. basically from Mick calling me up and the release and you know Mick calling me up in 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 February early February of 76 and the record being released March of 77 so it's a year and a month yeah but uh, there were so many stumbling blocks along the way and then when we finally got in the studio that's when things really gelled that's when we knew you know we had a band and we're putting things together and and you know it was just a uh, incredible experience with our first uh, producers as well. Um, they gave us a lot of leeway to do whatever we wanted to do. And we had, we're all, you know, talented musicians, so we knew what we were doing. And um, then it came out and uh, it just hit radio like a crazy, mm. you know. And then the other problem was we never played together as a band live. Yeah. I mean, we didn't go to, you know, we didn't start out playing clubs or anything like that, you know. Um, so we had to learn uh, each other uh, to do a live act, you know, where, where we have to put put together a whole live performance. And uh, luckily, the first uh, tour that we had, we opened for the Doobie Brothers, which was great. I mean, what a great bunch of guys and a great band. Um, so it was just a, a great experience to be out with them, to be able to, to hone our, you know, what we were doing on stage, you know, the interactions and things like that, and lengthening the songs, uh, you know, put solos in and make, making things, you know, um, be more performance oriented rather than in the recording studio. So that was a learning experience. It took us a while to, to get that to gel. And then, you know, within about four weeks of being out with the Doobie Brothers, our record was platinum and they wanted us to headline. So <laughs> there's even more that we had to do. We had to put together, we put filler songs in to yes. fill out, you know, a, 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 a headlining type of thing. So we, we had to stretch songs out. We made Star Rider into this really long, uh, with a lot of solos in the middle. And we added um, two songs. Uh, we did not fade away and love maker mm. um so we covered those two we added those to the set 
And now, as you were doing that, as you said, you guys didn't play clubs. You you know, you didn't grow up as teenagers playing together. You really got to know each other on the road. Yes. So after that year of touring and then, you know, the second record comes out and it's also a big hit. But at that point, you know, we see the dismissal of Ed. You know, is that when you kind of realize that like, OK, as we're starting to know each other, we got to work on the chemistry? Yeah. Um, I mean, being in a, in a band is like being in a family, you know, you've, you've got, you've got to live together. You've got to work together. Um, you have to make decisions together. There's a lot of pressure on you, you know, especially when you're a skyrocket like that, there's all eyes are on you, you know, so there's a lot of things going on at once that you have to perform and, and, um, we were all perfectionists as well, which didn't help. <laughs> you know, we all wanted to do the best we possibly could. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of things that uh, we were expected to do and, and to do well. And while we're learning and learning the craft and being together as a band. And so, uh, yeah, it, it was hard. It wasn't, wasn't easy like i said you know if, if you grow up together and you're school buddies and you're chums and you know each other and you 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 know you did the high school dances and you know you worked at clubs and worked your way up it's a totally different thing than you know putting together a band and then you know skyrocketing to the point where you, you've got so much pressure on you that you know you have to do things really well hmm. and uh so it was tough it was it was tough but, but we did it yeah and the for the third record for head games wasn't quite as successful as the first two were but for the third record in a row you and ian had writing credits on all of those early records um you actually co-wrote one of my favorite songs rev on the red line and you know that was your last album with the band that was ian's last album with the band was it simply mick and lou saying you know we have a vision and even though you were there at the beginning our vision is going to be the one we go with you know what led to that break uh that's a good question i i don't really know i also you know i can just say from my experience because i can't speak for anybody else but there were, you know, you could see the cracks and the little fractures coming into play um, after uh, Ed was asked to leave. Um, because you think that you're, you know, you're a cohesive unit and, and you know, you just did double vision so selling 8 million records. Um, so the whole idea of, of, you know, different little people you know, moving in their own little spheres was was kind of what was happening at the time. And Head Games was, um, it was an odd record for me. Uh, it was a good record. I, th I think people overlook it as, you know, what it was, but I think it turned out really well. Um, and it sold quite well over time, you know, it wasn't initially a, a huge seller. We had a lot of problems with the album cover. Uh, it was a bit controversial with mm -hmm. the young girl on the cover. And uh, the first single was Dirty White Boy. And there were stations that for some reason thought it was something else and they wouldn't play it. Um, and then the album cover wouldn't be put in certain record stores because they thought it, mm -hmm. It depicted something, you know, not quite right. So we had, we were, it was a rough period all around between the album coming out and the fractures within the band. And I, I just think that uh, whatever happened, it was their decision. I, you know, mm. I really was just, um, and Ian, both Ian and I um, were uh, not so well may, maybe a bit surprised but it uh it was something that maybe they thought had to be done that's all you know i, I can't speak for them and 
you left it's a after head games right after that is you know you were part of an extremely successful band they became even bigger after you guys left what was your reaction with four and then later on with age of provocateur and i want to know what love is was there part of you that you know wish it went different were you okay with where you were and what you were doing um i was okay with what i was doing i thought it was an opportunity for me to you know get more uh songwriting credits and things like that so you know i i, I started a band called spies yep. with ed and um but i you know when when i heard uh urgent i think that was the first single off of mm -hmm. four i said I was blown away. I, I said, this is a hit record. I mean, they they did it again. You know, it, it was just an amazing record. So I, I had, you know, nothing but joy for them. They, they put out another great record. Um, and then, you know, when, when uh, I Want to Know What Love Is came out, I mean, I stopped, you know, it's one of those car stopping moments where you hear a song on the radio and you got to pull over to the side to listen to it. That was, I said, wow, this is the number one, you know, there's no doubt in my mind. So, yeah, I, I felt good for the band. I mean, uh, it, it, they, uh, Mick started it. He, he deserves all the accolades he can get. He's a, a very underrated guitar player, but he's, he's extremely good and he, he should be up there with all the rest of them as a guitarist and as a song, they they both got into the uh Mick and Lou got into the songwriters hall of fame as well so um you know it it, it was an incredible experience and, and i i have nothing but praise for whatever they've done and for me to be a part of it you know it was just it's kind of overwhelming and much like a lot of their peers, you know, Foreigner kind of had its wilderness years with lineup changes and things like that before finally getting steady with Jeff Pilsen and Kelly Hansen. And I was there in 2018 at Mohegan Sun when you guys did the then and now with the original band coming back. What, what was, how were you able to come back to the fold at that point? point in that original band get together with the new version? Well, um, our current manager, Phil Carson, in 2017, he, he called all the members, the original members together for a meeting in Manhattan. And uh, we all got together, which was fine. I mean, I have, I have, you know, no ill feelings towards anyone. It, it, um, I was glad to see everybody um, and they were, you know, we were glad to, to, to be with each other. And Phil said, you know, it's our 40th anniversary and we'd like to do something really special for the fans for the 40th. So we'd like to do some reunion shows. And how does everybody feel? And we all said, you know, I think, I think this would be great, you know, to do something like that, to put it together again. So um, we got everybody on board, you know, um, and we started rehearsing, which was surreal, <laughs> to say the least, <laughs> to be back with everybody again, um, rehearsing and going over those songs again was just uh, incredible. I never thought that would ever happen. But here we were um, doing those songs again. And to be out on stage, you know, it was... Uh, it was the same lineup, the head games lineup, yep. and I'm on you know stage next to Dennis in the on the risers in the back, same place as I always was, and to look out over you know the the backs of you know Ian and Lou and 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 Mick and and uh, Rick, it was I, mean, I had to pinch myself. I had chills. It was amazing. It just felt so like. I just wanted to save for that moment forever. You know, it was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. 
And I, I've had the pleasure of speaking with Jeff Pilson quite a bit. And the last time we talked was about a month ago, and he was very complimentary of you specifically and the original band and how badly he wanted this honor for all of you guys. And I know Lou has had some issues with the current incarnation of Foreigner, <laughs> but I know you've come out and played with them a couple of times. Yeah. What's your take on this lineup? I think they're amazing. I mean, for them to carry the torch for this long, for Foreigner, um, and they're, they're a great bunch of guys, and, you know, personality-wise, they're phenomenal friends to, to, to be, be with when you go out there. But they're great musicians in their own right. And they love the songs, they, they play them so well, they put it, everything they've got into it, the shows are phenomenal. Kelly Hansen has got to be one of the best front men in rock and roll. No doubt, yeah. Um, I'm so proud of them to be out there and, and when, you know, Rick and I occasionally go out and do a special appearance and play with them. It's, it's just, it's just a joy for us to be with them. Great bunch of guys. And now getting back to the hall, have you talked to Mick and the other guys at all about what you might play or who you would like to induct the band, anything like that? It's really preliminary right now. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of talk of what could be um i know what i would like to do but you know i'm not i don't have the the power or the say to do it um but uh you know it's just a shame that um both ed and ian won't be with us to do this because they so deserve it as well and it, it'll be kind of sad that they won't be up there with us um, you know, that, that's kind of a, a hard thing. Yeah. And, uh, Mick Jones is in ill health as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, I hope he'll be there and I hope he'll, he'll, uh, be with us. That would be on, you know, that would be great. Yeah. Um, cause it's, it's his baby, it, it, you know, he was the architect of this and he has to be up there and do that. Um, I just hope he's well enough to, to, to be with us. Um, so th those are the things that, that sort of, I have to think about. And then the, the joy of performing, um, whatever they want us to do, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm all in, I'll do whatever they want us to do. Uh, I'm a musician. I can, you know, I'll play whatever they, they ask yeah. us to do. And I'll say as a fan, and I, I will be there in Cleveland. I've actually been to the last 12 inductions. So my wife and I are there every year. Oh, wow. We're huge fans. So we will certainly be there. Cool. As a fan, personally, I would love to see Jeff and Kelly be the ones that induct the original band in. I think that would be a full circle moment. I, I, I'm pretty sure the new foreigner band, all of them, will be with us yeah. in Cleveland. Um, I think that is pretty, if, if there is any decision, that is one of the decisions that's, mm. that's made. So they will be there. Mm. Um, but beyond that, we'll see. I mean, Paul McCartney did a special shout out to us. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, that would be kind of cool to have him come on board with us. Um, you know, Dave Grohl and Slash and Jack Black, yeah. I mean, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? I'm, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, just as anybody else, yep. see what happens. Well, we've been spending some time here with Al Greenwood of Foreigner, a newly minted Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. Uh, the ceremony is October 19th in Cleveland. Uh, can't wait to see you there. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this, and enjoy every bit of it, and have a great time at the induction. Well, thank you, Jeff. It was great speaking to you. Thank you.